they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon me.
Well, good morning, First Baptist. The Lamb has overcome, and we can have joy today as we worship Him. If you are a guest with us, we are so delighted that you're here. Each week, we've had more and more people come and more and more new faces in this room and in the overflow room and then online, and we would love to get to know you more. We are here not because we are good people, but because we serve a perfect and risen Savior, and we would love to pray for you. And so we would ask that you would fill out a a digital connect card. You can go online to First Baptist or FBCJacks.com, First Baptist website, slash connect, and you can fill out that form. And if that is too complicated, there's going to be a phone number during the service that pops up on the screen, and you can text us any prayer requests you have, any needs you have. We want to pray for you. We want to love you, and we're so glad you've joined us. Let's go now together in prayer and ask God to bless our time as we worship Him today. Heavenly Father, we want to reach all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life. And Father, I know there are people here from all stages of life, young, old, middle-aged, and God, we want to see every stage of life worship you. We are not here because we think we are better than everyone else or we think we're better than the world, but we are here because of Jesus. We are here forever for him to be glorified. Father, we ask that you would use us to reach all of Jacksonville, the west side, the north side, the south, the east, the beaches, downtown. We want all of Jacksonville to worship you forever. And so God, give us serious joy as we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sean. We do want serious joy this morning as we worship. When you recognize who it is that we're worshiping, you can recognize the need to be both serious and joyful as we think about the object of our worship this morning. I want to read to you from Ephesians chapter 1, the prayer that Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus, and by virtue of it being in Scripture, the prayer that we are praying for you this morning as we worship. Ephesians 1, 18 to 21, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. You know, we love to be near famous people. In fact, it's our great desire to get close to someone that's famous and important. And yet the reality of the fact that that they are famous keeps us away. There's security or there's distance or there's not an ability to get to know them. And yet the most significant, beautiful, magnificent, powerful being in the universe has not kept us at arm's length, but has said, come and be near me. And that is the great reality that worship presents us with. We can be near the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord. Let's stand and sing of his glory and our nearness to him.
Please remain standing as Jordan Bird comes to lead us in our scripture reading this morning. Please join me as we read from Psalm 78, verses 5 through 7. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Good morning, you can be seated. We are here together this morning for a celebration. I don't know if you knew that or not, but we're here every Sunday to uh, celebrate that Jesus Christ has conquered the grave has conquered our sin and has conquered the devil. And for anyone who would turn from their sin and trust in him, they can have life and life forever. We are celebrating that with singing. We're celebrating that with prayer. In a little bit, we're gonna celebrate that by paying attention to the word of God. Right now, I wanna celebrate it with some introductions to you. Jordan just led us in the reading of scripture about the reality that it is our responsibility to ensure that a generation to come, a generation not even yet born, knows God and knows his Christ. This summer, we have had a remarkable opportunity to fill a number of vacancies in our student ministry positions. Uh, you have uh, had the opportunity to meet some of these folks some ways. Uh, there's been a video that you've been able to see, but I wanted you to all be able to meet each one of them in person this morning. And so uh, as we prepare for a, a time of prayer, I want to meet you some of the newest, I want to introduce you to some of the newest members of our team. And uh, because we wanted them to feel as awkward as possible, I'm going to ask them to stand up when I say their names. So first, I want you to meet uh, Kaya Johnson, our student pastor. There he is. You stay, stay right there for a second. Uh, and he decided to bring with him from Southern California his wife and children. So Jessica and Indy, Athen, and Jet. Why don't you guys stand up? We're so glad that you guys are here. Thank you. And then Matt Cummings, who is our student discipleship minister. So many of you know that he's married to Courtney, and they've got their son, Jackson. So you guys have to stand up, too. They didn't come from Southern California. They came from right here at First Baptist Church. Uh, I want you to meet R.J. Lago and his wife, Alyssa. And that cute little guy, that he's waving. Rezzy, you can wave at Rezzy. Hey, Rezzy, we're glad you're here. <laughs> What a great guy. <laughs> You're not going to see RJ down here very often because he is the Nocatee student minister, but we're really glad that you guys are here from Georgia. Thank you. <laughs> Halicia Smith is our student discipleship counselor. And Isabella Schumacher, who you've met and know, she grew up here. And she's joined by her husband, Stephen. We are so thankful for each one of you, for those of you who are joining our ministry staff, for those of you who are joining our church family. Uh, and I want you to know that the, these uh, decisions on our part stand as just a portion of our commitment to be a church that is committed to a multi-generational pursuit of godliness so that a generation not yet born could know the Lord. We're going to pray, and what I'm going to do is ask you guys to stand up again, help you get your steps in. Let me ask you guys and your families to stand again, and we're going to pray for you as we, uh, as we ask the Lord's blessings on your lives and ministries in our church. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the Johnson and Lago and Cummings and Smith and Schumacher families. We're so thankful that you are doing a new and fresh work at First Baptist, and that you want to do so much of that through them. I pray for their homes, that they would be characterized by uncommon grace and godliness. I pray for their ministries, that so many people 
would come to know Jesus Christ through their ministries and that so many people would be built up in Jesus through their ministries. We pray that a generation that doesn't even exist yet, that hasn't even been born, would worship Jesus Christ because of their faithfulness. We are so thankful to be a part of a church that's making an investment like this, and I pray that you would confirm the work of our hands as we do it. And Father, as we continue in worship, help us to lift our voices and our hearts to Jesus Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. So grateful you guys are here. Welcome. When we worship together, there are several things that should happen if we were paying attention. We should recognize the grandeur and majesty and perfections of God. That should be a primary part of what we do when we worship. And we should recognize in light of His perfections, our imperfections. In fact, it should be a common response in worship to be reminded of sin that we have committed that week, possibly even this morning. And that is an appropriate response in worship because we are in the safest place to acknowledge sin because the cross is right in front of us and the risen Lord Jesus is extending uh, that offer of forgiveness because of his shed blood. And so what I hope will happen every Sunday as we gather to worship is that at some point in the service you'll recognize I have sinned this week or I've sinned this morning and I need forgiveness and I'm going to right now just ask the Lord to forgive me. The next thing that should happen is a reminder that Jesus has paid the penalty for that sin and that's why we can be forgiven. This next song that we're going to sing reminds us that in spite of how much we have sinned, his mercy, his kindness, his forgiveness always exceeds it. So let's stand together as we sing, his mercy is more. Since then. 
Welcome again to First Baptist. We're glad you're here. Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 32. Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 32. Our commitment as a church is that we are reaching all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life. And one of the reasons that we want to do that is because we want our city to share our total commitment to the Bible. One of the main ways each week that we demonstrate our total commitment to the Bible is by picking a book of the Bible and every week picking up where we left off as we see what God has to say to his people in that book. The Apostle Matthew had his life completely and utterly transformed by Jesus Christ. And he writes down what happened because he wants our lives to be transformed as well. We come in Matthew 12, verses 22 to 32, uh, to one of the most amazing passages in the book, because here Matthew is answering for us a question uh, that has been an enduring question in Christian circles, actually since Matthew wrote the thing. And it's the question of what is the unforgivable sin? And Matthew is going to give us the answer in the verses for today. Matthew 12, 22 to 32, this is what God says. Then... A demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Let's pray. Father, we want to come before you and we want to ask for your help. We need the Spirit of Christ spoken about in these verses, the Spirit of Christ that inspired these verses, to come now and empower the preaching of these verses and the hearing of these verses so that our hearts would be filled up with Christ and that we would be different than we are. So overwhelm us with Jesus today, we pray. Show us the glory of his person and the wonder of his power. Make us different and save our city. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember one of the first conversations that I ever had in ministry. I was uh, teaching on a Wednesday evening uh, at the church I was serving at the time. And I finished up and uh, a student uh, in the ministry that had listened to my sermon asked to talk with me. And so we found a corner someplace and we uh, started talking and he confessed to me that he was guilty of the sin of looking at pornography. We spent some time together that evening talking and as I tried to minister to him and help him see the truth and give him some comfort, the, this young man was completely inconsolable. Uh, there was nothing that I uh, could say that was bringing him any relief at all. He was overwhelmed with his trouble. And as we talked, it became so clear to me that this was a young man who was not just struggling with grief 
and with guilt over his sin, but he was overwhelmed with absolute fear. And as I started getting to the bottom of what was going on, he made it clear that he believed that in committing the sin of looking at pornography, he had become guilty of the unforgivable sin and he would be punished forever. That was the first of many conversations like that. I've had many conversations in ministry where people are afraid that they have committed the unforgivable sin. I talked with a man one time who left his wife and he was convinced that his divorce was the unforgivable sin. I talked with a woman one time who had committed adultery and she was persuaded that her adultery was the unforgivable sin. Many other conversations. The pain that comes into the life of a person who believes they have committed the unforgivable is overwhelming. It causes confusion. It causes concern. And they've got a point. Now, to be clear, one of the greatest things about Christianity is that whatever sin you commit, when you repent, you'll be forgiven. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says that if you confess your sins, God is faithful and God is just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That is a remarkable guarantee. It is at the heart and soul and the glory of what it means to be a Christian. That God is going to forgive you because of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All of our sins are covered when we confess them and turn to Christ. You here this morning, you watching online or listening on the podcast, if you would turn to Christ and look at him and repent of your sins, he will forgive you and you'll be forgiven forever. And yet, Jesus says here, that there's a sin that's not forgivable. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 to 32, Jesus says, I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. He adds another coat. Verse 32, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, we need to figure out what that is. What is it to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Confusion and pain enters into our life on this issue because we separate the concept of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit from the context in which it is discussed. Jesus talks about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit in a very specific context, and we need to understand what that is. Actually, when you look at these verses, you see three different ingredients that come together that when you add them together, you are guilty of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You've committed the unforgivable sin, and you'll be punished forever. So we need to know what these things are so that we won't commit this sin, so that we will be comforted Uh, if we have not committed it but think we have, and actually so that we can help other people who are struggling as well. So three ingredients, and here's the first one. The first ingredient of the unforgivable sin is an overt rejection of Jesus Christ. It's an overt rejection of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 12, we're in a section of Matthew's narrative where he is highlighting for us mounting rejection of Jesus. We've seen the Pharisees have questions and concerns. We've seen them move from questions and concerns to confrontation. And now they're moving from a confrontation to out and out rejection of Jesus Christ. We see that rejection of Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, when after a stupendous miracle, they openly and overtly reject Jesus and say, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. That's a pretty significant rejection of Jesus. You see that boy over there? That miracle he just did, he used the devil to do it. 
Don't trust him. Don't listen to him. This is a heinous rejection of Jesus. But it's a very specific kind of rejection of Jesus. You should never reject Jesus. Every sin, by the way, is some kind of rejection of Jesus. Every time you sin, you choose your sin and your way over Jesus' way. You should never do that. But whenever you reject Jesus, he will forgive you. That's what he says. In verse 32, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. You can speak against Jesus Christ. You can blaspheme Jesus Christ. You can reject Jesus Christ. You should never. But when you do, you can be forgiven. There hasn't been a more serious rejection of Jesus Christ than when he was executed on the cross. And while being executed, he prays to the Father and prays about his executioners and says, what? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The Apostle Peter, looking in Acts chapter 3, verse 17, looking at the people who have been guilty of the highest crime in history, the execution of Jesus, he looks at them and he says, I know that you did it in ignorance. The apostle Peter rejects Jesus three times, denies him three times. Jesus restores him. The apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor of the church, yet God had mercy on me because I acted ignorantly and in unbelief. These are some of the most famous Christians in history, and they rejected Jesus, and they got forgiven. You should never do it, but if you do it, Jesus will forgive you for rejecting him. So the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit requires rejecting Jesus, but it is a special kind of rejection. There's a special kind of knowledge about Jesus that is required in order to commit the unforgivable sin, and that gets to the second ingredient. Ingredient number two is obvious knowledge of Jesus Christ. Did you hear when we were talking about those passages a few moments ago, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The Apostle Peter said, the sins you committed, you committed in ignorance. The Apostle Paul said, I was given mercy because I acted ignorantly and in unbelief. It's possible to reject Jesus and not understand what you're doing. It's possible to blow him off because you don't really understand who he is. That's not the problem of the Jewish leaders, of the old guard religionists in Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, these guys have incredible first-hand knowledge of Jesus. Look at verse 22. Look, we've seen eight or nine miracles of Jesus so far in Matthew, but don't, don't let the weight of this be lost on you. A demon-possessed man. So there's somebody who's been overwhelmed by the devil, and it is afflicting him in a very specific way. He was blind and mute, and they brought him to Jesus. The devil has afflicted a person, and now he can't see, and now he can't speak, and they bring him to Jesus. And four wonderful English words. And he healed him. Isn't that wonderful? Here is a man overwhelmed with the power of the prince of darkness. He cannot see and Jesus speaks or touches him. He doesn't even say what he did. But his eyes open and he can see. Here is a man overwhelmed with the devil. And Jesus just does something and his mute lips sound forth. This is a glorious miracle. Everybody saw it. All the crowds were amazed. I've never seen anything like this before. Jesus has done this incredible thing. And they reject it. They can't deny it. They can't deny it. Everybody's seen it. 
They don't reject that the miracle happened. The only thing they can do to attack Jesus is the nature of the power he used to get rid of the demon. Everybody knows no human being that's ordinary can do this. Everybody knows something special has to happen. And so they say he did it by the power of the devil. Yeah, okay. Blind guy saw. Mute guy spoke. Okay, fine. But here's the, here's the real scoop. The real scoop is he's in league with the devil. Don't listen to him. This is an overwhelming charge. This is a shocking claim that Jesus Christ has used the power of the devil to do this work. And so Jesus responds to the charge, and he responds in four different ways. First, he says that the Pharisees, if you're going to say that I did this work with the power of the devil, then your first problem is you're being illogical. He says in verses 25 and 26, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Hey guys, try and keep up here, okay? If Jesus, uh, if I, Jesus, am going to cast out demons by the power of the devil, then that makes the devil not very smart. His point is that the devil is better at building a kingdom than the Jews think he is. You cannot at any national level, at any city level, at any house level, you cannot have the devil building up with one hand and tearing down with another and have that work. Come on, boys, keep up here. So first thing is, that's an illogical, absurd claim. The, the second response is that it's an inconsistent claim. We see this in verse 27. If I, Jesus says, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. What Jesus does here is he makes an observation that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, have some followers. They've got some disciples here called sons that claim to cast out demons. Jesus doesn't weigh in on whether the claim is accurate or not. He just talks about the reputation. He says, okay, so no normal person can cast out a demon, but normal people use the devil to cast out demons. Is that right? If that's right, then what about your friends? Are you saying your friends are demonic? You're just being inconsistent. And so here's what's going to happen. Those people are going to be your judges. They're illogical. They're inconsistent. They're also incorrect. Verses 28 to 29, Jesus says, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. How can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? He says, you guys are the opposite of correct. It's true. There is no way for a normal person to do this. You have to have some kind of power. But my power, Jesus says, is not the power of the devil. My power is the power of the Spirit of God. And Matthew has made this so clear as he's trying to explain who Jesus is. We found out in Matthew chapter 3 that the Spirit of God descended on him at his baptism and everybody could see it. We found out in Matthew chapter 4 that the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness to minister to him in the midst of his temptations. We found out last week that the sign and the seal of the approval of God on Jesus is Matthew chapter 12, verse 18, that he is the Spirit of God resting on him. And now Jesus says, if you want to know how I made a blind man see and a mute man speak, it's because of the Spirit of God. And if I have come to you with the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come. There has been an invasion of God into enemy territory. 
And the evidence of it is I am the Son of God standing before you in power with the Spirit of God empowering me to do these incredible works. And that means this is his fourth reply. The Pharisees aren't just illogical and inconsistent and incorrect. They are also in danger. He who is not with me, verse 30 says, is against me. Look, fellas, the kingdom of God has come. And you are looking. As you look at Jesus Christ, he says to them, you are looking at the personal manifestation of the kingdom of God. And there is no way into the kingdom but through this man. And if you will reject him and tear him down, then you make yourself a permanent enemy of the kingdom of God. And so be very careful. The religious leaders don't just reject Jesus. They reject Jesus in a very specific way. They observe and know that everything he does, he does by the power of the Spirit. And in rejecting his work empowered by the Spirit, they place themselves eternally at risk. But it's not just overt rejection of Jesus Christ. It's not just obvious knowledge of Jesus Christ. There's a third ingredient to commit the unpardonable sin. And it is open hostility to Jesus Christ. You got to reject Jesus, specifically rejecting his empowerment by the Spirit. And then rejecting that, you have to be openly hostile. The old guard religious leaders look at Jesus. They look at him do this amazing miracle and they immediately conclude the worst about him. It's the devil. There's options available. Could be the spirit of God, could be the devil. They immediately conclude the worst about him. All the evidence encourages believing the best. He's been a preacher and teacher of the word. He's been a faithful servant But they reject Jesus, proving that nothing that he does is going to be acceptable to them. But they don't just reject Jesus. They are openly hostile to Jesus. You see, after this amazing miracle, people who aren't as highly and falsely religious as the Pharisees They see this amazing thing, and they know what's happened. Verse 23, all the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man can't be the son of David, can he? Now, you got to remember, if you remember way back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, this is how Matthew starts out. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. Matthew starts out right at the very beginning. This whole account that I'm going to give for you is about how Jesus Christ has come as the messianic king and great David's greater son. This is about the son of David. And now Jesus has done the miracle. He's opened the eyes of the blind. He's loosened the tongue of the mute. And the people are starting to get it. They're like right on the line of belief. And they're going, "Uh, maybe this guy is the son of David. Maybe that's what's happening here. And the religionists come in and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't don't go down that road. No, no, no. Listen, the reason he did that is because of the devil. It doesn't have anything to do with the Messiah. It doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. He's working by the power of the devil. Do you see the tragedy of this? There are people right on the edge of eternity who are looking right over it and are tempted to reach out and trust in Jesus. And they say, no. It's the devil. It's not enough for them to reject Jesus. They have to, in a spirit of eternal hostility, keep other people from Jesus as well. It is one of the most horrible things you can imagine. It's those three things. 
that come together and create the unforgivable sin. When you reject Jesus with specific knowledge of who he is and what he does, and when you are openly hostile and block others from believing him, you are guilty and you can never be forgiven. Why? Why? Why that one? Why not another sin be unforgivable? Why not have any unforgivable sin? Why is that one? Well, it's because you and I have fouled this whole world up with our sin, with our rebellion. We are all, every one of us, guilty of high treason against the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he looks down from heaven from us and instead of engulfing each and every one of us in a ball of flames, he overflows with mercy and grace that is scarcely imaginable. And he sends his son Jesus Christ as the messianic savior, as the great Davidic king, as the son of God and son of man with the approval of heaven and the power of the spirit to live and die and rise as the only hope for life. The kingdom of God has invaded the sinful kingdom of man and if you will oppose it, if you will oppose Jesus as the messenger and the spirit as the power, then you make yourself guilty forever of treason against the king and you will die forever. You can't escape it. That's why. Because there's no hope apart from the work of Jesus accomplished in the power of the Spirit. So, what if you're afraid you've committed the sin? What if you're freaking out because you don't want to be guilty of high treason against the only king of the cosmos. Well, you probably haven't committed it. You just probably haven't. The amount of hostility you have to have for that king is not present in your heart by the time you're worried about what he thinks of you. But it won't be good enough for you to just stop it. Well, I'm not hostile, so I guess I'm okay. We need to take another step. And that requires a better recipe, better ingredients. The the recipe to get the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is rejection of Jesus, rejection of specific knowledge, namely the anointing of the Spirit in his life, and open hostility to him. But there's a better recipe, and it's in John chapter 6, verse 40. Jesus says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself, (laughs) personally, will raise Him up on the last day. You hear those two ingredients? Behold Jesus, believe Jesus. When you see Jesus as he really is, and when you trust in him, you will have life forever. This is a promise and a guarantee. It's a promise and a guarantee that if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you'll die forever. But they're mutually exclusive promises, do you see? What that means, this is very good news, if you this morning would look to Jesus and see him as he really is, and turn from sin and trust in him, then you'll have Jesus' personal guarantee that you'll be saved forever and it's not possible that you ever would have committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But we can do one better than that. If you would, by looking at Jesus and resting in him, secure eternal life and make it impossible for you to commit the unpardonable sin, then there's another thing you can do. You can share Jesus Christ This gets at the open hostility. In Romans chapter 10, verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, How will they preach unless they're sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. 
This is the opposite of open hostility. This is not God looking at you and saying you're cursed forever. This is God looking at you and saying you're beautiful. Because you're not openly rejecting Jesus in the spirit. You're spreading the good news. When you look to Jesus, when you trust in Jesus, when you share Jesus, that is not a recipe that makes you guilty of committing the unpardonable sin. That's a recipe that makes you a Christian. And you can have hope, and you can have hope forever. We're going to respond to this message in a very specific way today. We're going to respond by celebrating the Lord's Supper to remind us that all of our forgiveness and all of our life is based on the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that was given for us. As we uh, do that, uh, you received, uh, when you came in, our new socially distanced uh, communion apparatus. Um, And I I just want to give you two warnings about this. The first warning, as you've heard me say, is it tastes bad. This is not Welch's, but you'll be okay. And the second warning I want to give you is much more serious, because you might be tempted to think that because we gave you one of these when you came in, that it's all right for just anybody to have it, and that is not so. Uh, As a matter of fact, this is a celebration and remembrance of the Lord's death, but it is for people who have repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus Christ and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. If you have not repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus Christ and been baptized as a believer, we want to ask you to hold off. In fact, I want you to put that in your pocket or your purse or someplace safe and I want you to look at it as a reminder of the body and the blood of Jesus that you need to save you from your sins. We we don't want to make you feel bad. We don't want you to feel excluded. But there's a very specific reason why we would encourage you not to participate, and it's because of the teaching of 1 Corinthians 11. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27, And following, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. So because we love you, we don't want you to consume judgment here this morning. But it is also our desire that uh, if you can't participate with us, that this would be the last time that you wouldn't be able to participate with us. And that today would be the day that you, uh, you repent of your sins and trust Jesus. And if you want to do that, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond to that at the end of the service. And I promise you, we'll baptize you before we do it again. But for all of us who have repented of our sins and trusted in Jesus, this is a precious reminder, a four-dimensional reminder that we can taste and smell of the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. So I'm going to ask Todd Coleman and Terry Davidson, our uh, members of our deacons, to join me up here. Todd is our uh, chairman of deacons, and Terry is the uh, president of our trustees. And as we uh, prepare to remember the Lord's death for us. We're going to partake together of this reminder of the Lord's body, and I'm going to ask Terry Davidson if you'd lead us in a prayer thanking God for the body of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, the scripture the pastor just read reminded us that it is your commandment that we not come to the Lord's table in a manner that is unworthy. 
Father, it's talking about being a Christian there first of all, but Lord, it also reminds those of us who are Christians that we should not come to the Lord's table with sin in our heart. And so, Father, I ask that you would forgive us of our sins even now. Lord, there may be things in our lives that we have done that are displeasing to you. There may have been words that we have said that are unkind or untrue. There may have been thoughts that are impure. There may even be actions that were not honoring to you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins and cleanse us so that we might be pure and holy vessels as we approach the Lord's table. And then, Father, you told us to do this in remembrance of you. And God, when we think about the sacrifice that you made to give your only begotten Son, that he went to a cruel cross and paid the punishment that I deserve. Father, the pain, the agony, the suffering that he went through is hard for me to wrap my mind around. But I'm so grateful and so thankful that his body was broken, and because of that, we not only have life on this earth, but we have life, abundant life, eternal life to come. And so, Father, as we take the bread, we are reminded, as you told us in your word, to do this in remembrance of me, in Jesus' name. The Holy Spirit inspires the Apostle Paul to say, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Next, we're going to Remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf as we participate together in the blood of Jesus. And Todd Coleman is going to lead us in a prayer thanking God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you with grateful hearts, Father. Hearts that were able to come into your house, Father. The bride of Christ, Father. I thank you for my brothers and sisters, Father. And I just think we all should take a moment, reflect on our lives. Seek you, Father, and ask for your forgiveness where we fail you daily. Father, we thank you for Jesus, for the pain that he would endured, Father, bruised and bloodied, Father, to a cross on a hill, Father. Father, he did that for all of mankind, Father. His blood was shed for us, Father, and we know that your word says, without the shedding of blood, Father, we can't be saved that Jesus' blood washes us clean and white as snow, Father. And I pray that we would reflect and ask for your forgiveness, Father, and rejoice that your blood is sufficient to save us, Father. And we thank you for Jesus, his love and willingness for each and every one of us, Father. And I pray that it would stir in us not only to live a more holy life, Father, but it would stir in us an attitude of thankfulness, of gratefulness, and one that exudes you, Father, that everyone might see you in us because of the love we have for one another and for the lost world around us, Father. Jesus, oh, we, how we thank you for the blood that you shed for each and every one of us. And we thank you for this in your name. Amen. The Apostle Paul says, through the, through, says by the Holy Spirit, in the same way he took the cup, also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.